In this episode, I am once again joined by Ralph White, holistic learning pioneer, international speaker on cultural transformation and the history of the Western esoteric tradition, and co-founder of the New York Open Center. Ralph recounts his clandestine mission into Tibet in 1989 on behalf of the Neichung Oracle, hiking solo across the border, evading commissars, escaping from bandit villages, enlisting the aid of camper horsemen, and encountering a UFO high in the Himalayas. Ralph recalls the founding of the Art of Dying Conference, reflects on his own relationship with his father, and describes the religious genius of Rudolf Steiner on death and what lies beyond. Ralph also discusses the Western esoteric tradition, tells stories of Robert Bly's Rosicrucian poetry, and critiques logical positivism and the limits of academia. So without further ado, Ralph White. Ralph White, welcome back to the podcast. Glad to be here, Steve. I was just telling Ralph before we began recording how well received the first episode we did together was, and that covered a lot of Ralph's life. From England to America to Machu Picchu to New York, very interesting adventure. <laughs> so I'd, I'd refer people back to that episode. Of course, I'll uh, include it in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing we did a bit of a cliffhanger at the end of the last episode about the what I called the Tibet incident. <laughs> or as I said to uh, Ralph before he began, his walking holiday in Tibet. Yes. In the Jeweled Highway, you write, Ralph, in February 1989, during a trip around the world after the first five exhilarating but exhausting years of the Open Center, I found myself in Dharamsala, India, staying at the Tibetan Nechung Monastery, home of the only functioning political oracle in the world. So much for a break. So can you talk a little bit about what, what were you doing there? And also, what, what was the remarkable story of what happened next? Well, this was, what was it? 19, it was 1989, I think it was. And... Um... So through a friend, I wound up spending a month at the Nechung Monastery in Dharamsala. It's a working monastery. It has very few visitors. Uh, it, as, I, as you said, it's, it's, to my knowledge, the last functioning political oracle in the world. Um, I happened to be there where they did the annual or the six monthly invocation of Peha Gyalpo, the, uh, the protective deity of Tibet and of the Dalai Lama. And so, uh, you know, I'd wake up in the morning in the little room I was staying in and you'd hear the monks chanting, you know, that deep bass, you know, and they hear the big trumpets. It was, I think it was a five or six day ritual that went on invoking the deity. Um, And uh, I asked if I could join them to meditate. So I just sat at the back of the meditation hall on the side and meditated for a couple of hours while they did their wonderful ritual and uh, afterwards the uh, senior monk came to me and uh, said they needed to get some material into Tibet to Lhasa that they'd heard that I was planning to take the first flight of the year on April the 1st or was it May the 1st Um, and would I be they said they'd been waiting for the right person to do it because it was impossible for a Tibetan to do it and uh, would I do it and if if I would, they would put me under the protection of the, the Peha Gyalpon. They gave me a cut, a white scarf, and so on. Um, so I said yes, thinking that uh, I would get on that flight on the first of the month, the first flight from Kathmandu to Lhasa, and uh, hopefully make it through customs. <laughs> um, I thought I might get thrown out. But... Um, Anyway, what happened, because that was 89, which is the 30th anniversary of the uprising against the Dalai Lama, I mean, again, in support of the Dalai Lama and against the Chinese invasion in 1959, the Chinese communist invasion. Um, There were big demonstrations to mark that 30th anniversary, not so big, but there were demonstrations in Lhasa. And simply to hold up a piece of cardboard with a rough Tibetan flag on it would be enough to elicit serious, if not fatal, interest from the police. So... Uh, they closed, uh, They didn't want Westerners seeing this, so they closed the borders of Tibet and threw all uh, Westerners out. So it became impossible. There was no flight on the first of the month, and it looked like it would be impossible to uh, take this uh, material. It was a book, actually. So 
um, that they needed to get to the other monastery. Uh, the, the Chinese had allowed a small version of the Nechung Monastery to open with just half a dozen monks in Lhasa, and they wanted me to get it to there. So uh, there was no flight, so it looked like it was impossible. And then uh, one day when I was in Kathmandu, I bumped into a guy who was researching a book on trekking in Tibet. People had started trekking in Tibet, going to places like Mount Kailash and so on. And he told me about a route into Eastern Tibet last done by a guy called Joseph Rock, fascinating figure that our listeners might be interested in exploring more, an Austrian American explorer, fascinating guy who established the Department of Botany at the University of Hawaii, but then went to the borderlands of, uh, of China and Tibet, the Nashi people up on Luku Lake, this extraordinary world, this beautiful lake up at 8,000 feet, um, on the borders of Tibet, Sichuan and Yunnan, which is one of the world's last surviving matriarchies. And um, so I wound up, he, he gave me an article from the National Geographic of 1922 by Joseph Rock called Journey to the Land of the Yellow Lama and said, this is how he did it into Tibet through the Eastern route. You see, we think of Tibet as those big high flat plateaus um, you know, up at 12 or 13,000 feet, like the Altiplano in Peru and Bolivia. But Eastern Tibet is very different. Eastern Tibet is the land of the wild Kampa warriors. They're all, they, they all have long hair. They all have lots of earring. They, most of them carry swords. <laughs> They're crack shots. And they say, a man without an earring will be reborn as a donkey. So <laughs> I, was, I was sure to wear my turquoise earring when I was with the campers. They're wild and crazy guys. They're like uh, Chinese cowboys in some ways, but I, some people think they're descended from Genghis Khan, but they protected the eastern flanks of Tibet for centuries. And eastern Tibet is these huge gorges. It's the area called Four Rivers, Six Ranges. Um, four huge rivers come pouring through a fairly narrow area, which is massive. I've never seen valleys like it. You know, you'd get to the top and you'd look down the valley and, whoa, you could barely even make out what was right down there at the foot of those valleys. So that's where I was in Kham. K-H-A-M, home of the Kampas, the, uh, the guys I've talked, the crazy guys. So anyway, so that's, that was the story. So I, I wind up fly, I went to Thailand, I flew to Kunming uh, in Yunnan province. I traveled overland uh, as far as I could get and then made my way up to Luku Lake <laughs> through a little, uh, well, careful planning, put it that way, the subterfuge, uh, because no foreigners were supposed to be there. And then, um, and then made my way. And then, uh, as luck would have it, I was just in a very remote area. Um, and out of the blue, these four, I was going to trek across the mountains by myself. I mean, because the, the monsoon was coming. And um, I had to go if I was going to go. And so I was looking, I'd be just heading out into these border mountains that were pretty remote and pretty forbidding. And then these four young German guys showed up out of the blue when I'm just about to leave. We found ourselves on this rickety old bus going in the rain and staying in some drenched little guest house in this um, godforsaken little town. And uh, so we were stuck there for a night. I told them what I was going to do there and they asked if they could come. So I wound up, one guy was in the Vamrock, the other was a triathlete. I mean, these guys were fit. So I wound up having a sort of personal bodyguard, these four young German guys um, across the mountains into Calm. And so, uh, yeah, that's how it all began. That's how I managed to get in there. And I uh, mean, to cut it a, a long story short, I. Uh, it's a whole chapter in my book, The Jeweled Highway. Um, request from the Oracle of Tibet, I think I called it. And uh, I did, yes, I wound up making it as far as uh, Litang uh, and um, right up to as far as you could go because it was a state of martial law in Tibet. These were the borderlands of you know, Western Tibet, uh, Western Sichuan. Which the, which the Tibetans consider Tibetan and the border with the autonomous province of Tibet, which the, the Chinese consider it to be. So, um, but it, it's a Tibetan ethnic area with monasteries. One of the Dalai Lamas have been from, uh, one of them at least was from, one of the more famous ones was from Litan. Um, 
so yeah, so I, I did wind up making my way as far as a place called Batang and uh, be, being able to hand over the material that I'd been bought and then get the hell out of there. <laughs> and only then did I, you know, when I left to go into the mountains, um, there was a state of extreme political turbulence in China. Um, of course, there were demonstrations in the streets and uh, some of our viewers will be old enough to remember Tiananmen Square, but all of that was building up to a head when I was still um, in, uh, in Yunnan. And so I, when I headed off into the mountains, I didn't know what, if anything, had happened. And it was only when I got out of a month in the Himalayas there that I found out that in fact, you know, the nightmare of Tiananmen Square had taken place. And when I saw TV for the first time, getting back into Ya'an, a town or a city, it's just uh, when you first start to get into the lowlands of China after being in the Himalayas, I saw a TV and it was, you know, seeing students being dragged out of uh, police vans after being roughed up and, you know, just the whole nightmarish aftermath of uh, Tiananmen Square, it was, it was, you know, textbook totalitarianism, really. It was straight out of the pages of 1984. Um, with, you know, obviously I can't understand China, but just looking at the, the images on the television and, um, and reading the, the People's Daily, I think it was called the English language newspaper the Communist Party put out, but it was just, it was, you know, complete lies. The students had done it, you know, they had attacked the army and so on. So uh, it was a profound experience. So that whole journey, um, I've never been sure if that material I was asked to take in, if it made it into the Nechen Monastery because I had to leave it with a monastery in Batang, but they said they had traders who went uh, twice a month to Lhasa and they would take it. So uh, I'm not sure whatever happened, but it was certainly a, a, a riveting and compelling experience for me, as well as one of the most exhausting and uh, dangerous things I've ever done. But you know, that's what happens when you spend a month in a Tibetan monastery and uh, you participate with them in the invocation of the protective deity. It gets into your heart and soul. So uh, I'm glad I did it. Would I do it again? Looking back now, 30 years later, I was thinking, uh, I must have been, um, well, obviously I was up for an adventure and also up for contributing something to uh, the Tibetan cause, which I've always, you know, ever since I was a boy, since I was 10 or 11, I've always been fascinated by Tibet. And um, in the early days of the Open Center in New York, you know, we did many, many programs before Tibet House existed, just like we did many mindfulness programs before the different mindful centers uh, started going. So yeah, that's the short version there, uh, Steve. It's, uh, the long bush, I think it's the longest chapter in the book, um, but uh, yeah, tells the story. Can you give a sense of what your daily routine was on that trip? Were you going from uh, settlement to settlement, staying uh, in settlements each night, or were you camping out? What was, your, what was the sort of regime you were following in terms of travel and uh, camp and so on? Yeah, well, to get over that first borderland mountains from Luku Lake, from Yunnan into, um, Muli, the Tibetan province of Muli, which is the southeast province of old Tibet. Um, that was, yeah, where I had those four young guys with me. That was camping out. Yeah, that was just, you're, you're in the mountains, you're in high mountains. I know actually the first night, the first night we stumbled into a Nashi village that is um, these indigenous people who, uh, I'm not sure what they speak. I think it's some kind of Tibetan derived language. <laughs> I couldn't understand a word of it. But yes, we stumbled into this village. It was like stepping back into the 17th century. Uh, I mean, they, they'd never seen white people before. They were stunned. Uh, but they, once they got over their shock, they, you know, they were hospitable. They invited us into one of their huts. They had a big old, they had a huge blazing fire. It was like, and this huge, it was like an old, which is cauldron as we see them a great big cauldron underneath this flame the flames and they were cooking something in there um and there were people were just around there were old grannies then there who were topless i mean um there were all kinds of people um i just remember the uh the the darkness the smoke the uh 
it was hospitable, but it was extremely alien and other, to say the least. And then, yeah, we, then we had to make it on and just make it over that pass. My God, it went on. I mean, some guy provided us some donkeys to get, to carry our packs, but we thought he was going to take us to the top of the pass, but we still had another two hours to go of back breaking. I mean, I don't know what the altitude was there. It had to be 13, 14,000 feet. Um, so yes, then it was camping out up there and then finally making it over the top and seeing a village way, way down below. And then, you know, I've, as I said, I've never seen such huge valleys and then making it down to there and then staying in some funky little, you know, rundown guest house and then going over to the monastery the next day. So it was, yes, it was, so it was that kind of thing or, or I would, or then hitchhiking, you know, I, I mean, I've managed to get a ride to some, uh, tiny little village that I hoped was in the right direction. And, um, and then it became too insane. I mean, when, when we'd pull up into a little village in the back of a truck, the whole village would come out. They'd be shocked, they'd be mobbed, they had never been. <laughs> um, and then they'd be literally banging on the doors and banging on the windows. It was, it was extremely claustrophobic. So the four guys, the four German guys turned around, they'd had enough and I went on alone and, uh, with a guy called Shinkaka, a young Sino-Tibetan teenager I bumped into, offered to show me the way over the next pass, um, which I did do. So that was camping out with him. And I think I did put one, epi one mention in that, I thought I should include it in the book, whereas we were high, high up in this remote, we were still a couple of thousand feet below the pass in this high, high remote mountainside. And it was very cold, even though it was June, so I got into the little tent. I was in my sleeping bag and I always remember Shinkaka. That was the name of uh, that young guide or amateur guide. And he, I can remember him coming running down the mountain and he couldn't say Ralph. You know, it's hard for people from that part of the world to pronounce R. So he was, he was shouting, Lurfer, Lurfer, Lurfer. And uh, I thought, what's this, you know? And I poked my head out of the tent door and up in the sky, it looked like, I don't know, four or 5,000 feet above these jagged mountain peaks, there was this stationary object. And I've, I've never been interested in you. Well, I mean, I've never been into UFOs. <laughs> Hasn't been a big interest of mine. But, uh, but there it was. it was. It was an entirely spherical ob object, absolutely stock still in the sky. Uh, it wasn't radiating light as most... Uh, as it's po UFOs as, as popularly portrayed. It was more of a burnish color. It was about an, an eighth the size of the moon. It was reflecting light and it was absolutely stock still. I've always had excellent eyesight, even at this age, I don't even need glasses. So, um, you know, I, so I looked at it because we were way above the cloud level. So the, the air was crystal clear. I thought, what on earth is that? What is there that is totally spherical? that can just stand there stationary in the sky. I mean, I watched it for about 15, 20 minutes and then it was so cold, I had to get back in the tent again, but I figured, well, maybe, maybe it's a meteorological balloon or something, you know, and it's on some kind of winch. And maybe when we cross the mountains the next day, we will, uh, we will find a meteorological station. It seemed unlikely. Anyway, we went the next morning, we went up to these Tibetan nomads in their black yak hair tent. And, I, you know, they were just, I could speak a few words of Chinese, which they, you know, they were bilingual. So um, all they said, the first, when you go to China, the first phrase you learn is Wobadong, Wobadong means I don't understand. <laughs> so they, and I could count to 10 <laughs> in Chinese at that point, actually I could count to 100. So they just pointed to where it was in the sky and they said three nights, Wobadong, 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 we don't understand. That is it. So it had clearly just appeared from nowhere in three successive nights. I, anyway, when we crossed the pass, it was all this sort of shale mountain pass. Um, the next day after being with them, it was just a sea of mountains stretching out in every horizon. There was no, there was one tiny little path. Um, there was no meteorological station there. So what was that? I have no idea, but I put it in the book because I just thought, when you encounter these anomalous, strange experiences, it's worth recording them. Um, so yeah, so then it was making it onto there into this tiny little, no, I, we stayed with these Tibetans in there. 
smoke blackened house in a tiny village and then on to another town where I had to deal with a Chinese communist commissar. Uh, so I would just point at my, the stamp in my passport and say, yeah, <laughs> as if it legitimized me. Anyway, it was, yes, it was a, it was a nerve wracking experience, but uh, unforgettable. I will never forget it. And I hope that material made its way to, uh, to Lhasa. And um, I got out in one piece and <laughs> I'll never forget it. What was this running with the Commissar? Well, when we got down to Shinkaka, the teenager and I got down to the foot of this huge pass, you know, we got down into this village, hours and hours and hours of dropping down um, into this little village. And uh, we were looking for a place to just pitch the tent, really. And uh, then the next morning, this guy showed up wearing a leather jacket, the only guy with a leather jacket in the village. He didn't say who he was, but he was obviously the Communist Party um, representative. And uh, he didn't speak any English. Nobody spoke any English. So it was just sign language, you know? So I just put on a sort of cheerful demeanor and pointed at the, my Chinese stamp in my passport. And, you know, he wanted to know how I got there. And I, because to get there, you couldn't do it. The reason I'd gone over the mountains is because you couldn't do it via the road. If you went by the main road, you'd be stopped and turned back or fined or thrown out of the country um, for trying to get in. So that's why I went in over the mountains. So uh, he figured I must have been let through the pass because I didn't say I'd gone over, I couldn't, I didn't have the vocabulary to say I'd gone over the mountains anyway. Um, so yes, it was a bit nerve wracking. It, it turned out to be a very, very unsavory village actually. It had a real bandit vibe. Um, you know, the, they weren't campers, those people, but I don't know who they were sort of Sino-Tibetan more, a bit more on the Chinese side than the Tibetan side. Um, but yeah, you know, certainly the campers have a, a reputation as not just being warriors, but being bandits too, you know. <laughs> the same family, if there'll be five brothers, a couple will become a bandit, so one, one will become a monk, you know. <laughs> it's... Uh, and as far as they're concerned, you know, it's they're, they're like Scottish Highlanders, you know, they have a sense of revenge, vendetta in Sicily. If you don't get them in this incarnation, you'll get them in the next, you know. It's not quite, it's a bit of a parody. But um, yes, it was a, it was, um, it, that village wound up having a very bad vibe. I figured how there was a certain criminal element there. And uh, I just needed to get out. So, uh, yeah. I just grabbed my bags and uh, got out of there. I didn't like what was going on, just based on the vibes, and just started heading down this dirt road into the mountains. What do you mean, the vibe? The what vibe. Were you observing. What were you observing? Um, while I was away talking to some people, I had an intuition to go back to where I'd left my bag, and I got back. I ran back there really quickly, and people were starting to open up my bag and take stuff from it. Um, they uh, asked if I wanted to have some kind of a meal, a fish meal. I was one of the people spitting the fish bones out on the floor. And then it turned out, oh, I was supposed to pay for it. I thought there were, you know, there was just a few little things like that. And people aren't being entirely straight here. Um, it looks like theft might be in the offing. It looks like they're trying to take you for a bit of a ride. You know, it wasn't a good vibe. It was, you know, the message was get the hell out of here and uh which i did you know but then i'm you know i'm heading down this dirt road into the middle of the himalayas and i had really no idea where i was there were no maps and it looked like the road just hit a pure dead end you know i was just looking at going down this dirt road and it just seemed to be a huge mountain wall facing me i couldn't go back that would mean going back through that you know un unpleasant village and it looked like i couldn't go forward it was just a somehow the road just led to a massive cliff face. So it was one of those moments, you know, you're stuck in the Himalayas in the middle of nowhere. That's where years of meditation practice comes, it comes in useful. So I just remember sitting on a rock by the side of the road and just um, going into the best I could muster for a deep meditation, just to, just to chill out and relax and get away from that, you know, pounding heart and the stress. So um, I did, so I chilled out and I just um, 
meditated there for half an hour, wherever it was, and just, you know, got back into a more centered space, walked on a little further, and then suddenly a Tibetan horseman appeared, um, went round a bend, and I just asked him the name of the village that I was going, you know, that's all we could say, really. He, had a, he was totally different from the villagers. I don't know where he came from, but he was radiant. He was, he was a lovely person. He was helpful, smiling, pointed in the right direction, um, you know, told me the number of miles or kilometers it was roughly. And I walked a little further on and it turned out what was the total dead end was in fact, just a right angle swerve in the river. And, um, and in fact, it wasn't, you know, the end of the road. It just turned in a way that was invisible from further down the valley. So it all worked out and then I made it on. I made it to another little settlement, spent the night there. They were very nice. And then the farmer there had a little, a, a little tractor with, um, a sort of box on wheels that was behind, behind the tractor. And I could got in there with about five or six other Tibet, Tibetan women. And he drove us to uh, the nearest uh, the nearest town, which is about six, 60 kilometers away. That was one of the best rides I've had in my life. And then I into this town, Daocheng, a Chinese town and a dusty, desolate Chinese town. And I walked into, I thought, I thought well, I'll try to find some little guest house here. So I walked into the guest house and I always remember that the woman behind the reception just took one look at me and screamed, <laughs> screamed at the top of her voice. She'd never seen a Caucasian person before. I must have looked like some kind of demon or whatever. I'll never forget that. Yeah. And then I got a visit from the Chinese police. Um, and I just did my usual act of uh, acting dumb and pointing at my passport. And then I got out the next morning, I got a ride with some truck drivers before the, the Chinese police returned. So yes, it was, uh, it was a wild experience, but um, I just had, I had that inner commitment to deliver that material for the Nechung Monastery. And uh, so that's what I did. Remarkable. How old were you at that time? I had just turned, um, I think I just turned 40. I think when I, when I got, when I was trekking in Nepal before that, I was 39, they're right, I think I turned 40 in Kathmandu, and then I just turned 40 when I came on to do this. It's the kind of thing you want to do when you're like 25. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's what I was thinking. I thought you should, yeah, that's old enough to know better, Ralph. Yeah, I know it is. And I think <laughs> you know, most of my preparation for it had been, you know, lying on a beach in, uh, in Thailand for a couple of weeks <laughs> before I'd gone back to Nepal and then to Tibet. So, uh, yeah, I wasn't exactly in uh, peak, uh, peak physical condition, but I've, I've always had a lot of stamina. You know, I was a cross-country runner with my, in my youth. So... Uh, I, you know, I just had fortunately reserves of vitality to draw upon. But yes, I was older. <laughs> and those young German guys, I'd say they were in their mid twenties, and they were, you know, a, tri a triathlete and a guy in the German army and so on. So they were in good shape. But you know, of course, by the time I finished it, I was in pretty good shape too. <laughs> but yes, I'll never forget that first four day hike across the pass. It's absolutely exhausting, and of course, it's the, it's the altitude and the weight on your back how did you provision yourself that that's a month right was the whole thing a month all told yeah it was a month um well god how did i provision myself i you know i think i just that they didn't have camping goods stores in china <laughs> i must have taken just some basics along and um Oh yeah, that's right. I had I had virtually nothing for that that three day hike across the mountains with Shinkaka. Um, I, I think I pretty much just relied largely on getting food in the little settlements that I encountered, and then maybe had some uh, rice and some other basic staples for just camping out in between. Um, yeah, I mean, parts of it were done with very, very little food and, very, and, I, and I had uh, water purification pills. So fortunately, I never got sick on that. Even though I was in remote areas and drinking water out of little rivulets and streams, I was lucky I never had a day's illness. Whereas Shinkako, he actually got sick, but then he was, he, he was drinking much more casually out of the, uh, out of the streams. Mm. 
you know, that's that's adventure is really something out of the pages of Alexandra David Neal or something like that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, um, that's right. Kind of remarkable, actually, to have such an experience. Did that leave an impression on you when you came out of that? What did you do immediately afterwards? Did you return to the monastery in Kathmandu? Um, uh, no, because the monastery was in Dharamsala, you know, in northern India. Uh, by that time, when I, of course, I was in China. Um, no, I left, I flew from Chengdu to Kunming, then from Kunming back to Thailand. And um, and then what happened? I, I think, uh, no, I made my way then down through, uh, through Malaysia to Singapore and then on to, uh, Indonesia and then wine and then finally had one of the best weeks of my life on Lombok which is the island east of uh, Bali so I continued you know it was part of a round the world trip really so I yeah I needed to just chill out and relax yeah. <laughs> for that experience so yes I, I just went on to Thailand Malaysia Indonesia and then eventually Australia New Zealand back to Hawaii and then back to the States um, so yeah when did you realize just how dangerous that situation was was it during or sometime afterwards you thought well I was not even when I set off you know I can remember heading to the airport in Bangkok to get on that weekly flight to Kunming you know it's just before things this was still hardcore communist China you know when I went back to China four or five years ago I was stunned by the changes but in 1989 China was still, most people were just riding bicycles. Kunming Airport was just a few very simple buildings. Today, it's a gleaming. I mean, China's unbelievable today in terms of the infrastructure building. Um, but no, I remember heading out to the airport. <laughs> Talk about a knot in the solar plexus. Um, you know, I figured I, what I was carrying, I might get busted at the airport. And, uh, so I try to be philosophical about that, you know, I mean, hopefully they'll just deport me uh, if that's what happens. Um, but it was such a ramshackle little airport at that time that, you know, I mean, actually the customs was virtually non-existent. It was just a an old conveyor belt and a couple of dudes in uniforms standing around. So that was the first thing, getting into China, you know, without that material um, being... Um, confiscated so yeah that's what i remember amazing what happened in lombok is it was the best one of the best weeks of your life well lombok yeah i mean i think since then you know it, it, there have been various forms of um violent uh, islamic extremist um, attacks in lombok but in those days it was uh, it was not that visited, you know, of course, Bali, the first thing would immediately to the West was the place where everybody was. But, well, I met this Australian bloke and we rented a couple of motorbikes and we just drove around that island on these remote little roads for a week. And it was just exquisitely beautiful. The people were incredibly friendly. Um, there were gorgeous mountains and beaches. You stepped into another world. It was another, you know, I wound up at a kind of shamanistic ceremony from the, the indigenous I mean, they're nominally Muslim uh, there, but in fact, you know, you've got the indigenous animism that is going on there too. It was just a week of bliss, I would say, really, just incredible beauty, um, gorgeous weather, lovely people, and, um, you know, just one of those perfect weeks where nothing went wrong, everything was wonderful. You, were, you, you go into that state of wonder, and joy. Um, there's not that many weeks that come along like that in your life that are not interrupted by some uh, crisis or the other. But um, yeah, it was just um, that was an exquisitely beautiful week, just as that month in Tibet was just about the most nerve wracking month I've ever been. Because, you know, the combination of tension and altitude mm. and danger and uh, not knowing where you are. I had a map done by a British map from 1919. <laughs> Nobody had done, that was before satellites had tried to, you know, 
geolocate villages and so on. So it was a pretty out of date map. So I didn't know where I was a great deal of the time. So those things had all had up to a, a highly stressful experience. That's why you need a week in Lombok afterwards just to chill out and to uh, enjoy life again. You know, you mentioned there that very unusual sighting of, well, I suppose it is a UFO because you didn't, you couldn't identify the flying object or the floating object. Yeah, the stationary object, a spherical stationary object stuck still in the sky for, um, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. And yeah, and then of course the evidence of the, uh, the nomads the next day, three nights, patong, 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 we don't understand. So what could that be? I mean, I, I honestly don't know. Certainly, it certainly didn't conform to the usual, you know, now that the US um, military is releasing information about its pilots, you know, tracking these zooming things that come shooting out of nowhere and then, you know, perform things that no contemporary aircraft possibly could. It wasn't anything like that. It was just a sphere still in the sky, crystal clear air. And nothing, you know, I tried to see, was there a, something hanging beneath it, like a gondola or some sort of nothing. So, yeah, I just put it in the book because I thought it just remains one of the true enigmas of my life. I have no explanation for it. I'm curious, you know, you've done many journeys like this, actually, not quite, not quite like that journey in the Himalayas, of course, but, but you've been to many remote places yeah. um, for all sorts of reasons, uh, exploration and also uh, for your con various conferences uh, that, you've, that you've held. Yeah. Um, have you seen anything else like that in, in your travels? No, I've never seen anything that would uh, conform to, you know, what we might call a UFO or something. Mm -hmm. No, I haven't. And, um, I mean, we've all had little moments of being, seeing lights on the horizon, you know, from the, the Berkeley Hills or something over San Francisco Bay, or that's weird, but you know, nothing that was, uh, but there were many lights and look, and lots of planes and all kinds of things uh, in the air. Whereas something like that, it was completely deserted and totally remote. I, I doubt if any Westerner had ever been there before where I was. So, you know, crystal clear night sky, tremendously remote, no other interference, clear as a bell. So no, that's the only one I've ever had. Yeah, I mean, Jules Highway's full of these sorts of uh, adventures and, and stories um, really, uh, captivating memoir uh, you know something else that we we were we were saying we we're going to talk about today which i'm very curious about is the art of dying conferences uh, that you began in the spring of 1995 in 2020 you had a 20 a big 25th anniversary uh, celebration of that and it's gone on to become the art of dying institute it's evolved in, into an institute you have um even the uh, a certification program integrative thanatology certificate yeah, which is uh, totally fascinating. So, you know, you've talked about the need for a cultural awakening around mm -hmm. the theme of death and mortality um, mm -hmm. and, and how we die and therefore the consequences for how we live. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious, how did that come about? And uh, all of it really, but how did it begin? Uh, and what has that journey been? Well, it was uh, the Open Center, you know, the New York Open Center, the main center for holistic learning that I co-founded, uh, had been going for about 10 years in the mid 90s. And I was feeling, you know, we, we were doing courses and workshops and lectures and performances, but I was starting to feel it was time to do something deeper, starting to do some major conferences to have, um, that could have some serious cultural impact. And um, I've known uh, Robert Thurman for a long time. Uh, most of your viewers would know his daughter, Uma Thurman, but uh, you know, I've known his parents, Bob and Nana Thurman for years and years. In fact, Nana took on my job while I went around the world uh, for a year and a half for that adventure until that happened. So anyway, I was we were talking to Bob and Bob had just done a new translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And so with us, with the Open Center wanting to do those events, larger events, and we, we said, let's, the idea came up, let's just do it. And also, I think um, a couple of people, Jackie Kennedy, and of all people, Richard Nixon, not, not my favorite American president, um, they had both chosen to die with dignity, you know, and, and you know, not to be just kept alive on a machine forever. 
And I remember that was front page or so prominently in the New York Times. And I, and I, was, I was thinking, you know, times are changing here. People are not performing the usual desperate efforts to keep people alive. Uh, there is a, a, a moment impulse for starting to have hospices more, uh, but it was just the very beginning. And this is, yeah, 95. And so really it, it, the idea emerged between me and uh, another program director at the Open Center and uh, Bob Thurman to, to do a conference around dying. And then I thought, what am I going to call it? And uh, I remembered, <laughs> you may remember from the book where I go down Route 66, um, my first Christmas in America through the deserts of New Mexico and George Harrison's all things about, well, you know, my sweet Lord's playing all the way down route 66. And then we get to Tucson and all things must pass, you know, that great album had just come up. And so we were staying in a, a ranch in the Catalina mountains uh, outside Tucson, listening to all things must pass. And, you know, which is a great, I love that album under the starlit skies, you know, Tucson's an astronomy capital. And, um, I, you know, one of the tracks there is called The Art of Dying. And I just thought, you know, I don't think George will mind. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just call these conferences, you know, The Art of Dying, because of course the origin of that is it's medieval Latin. It comes from the 14th century manual, the Ars Moriendi. It was the manual created during the Black Death, the plague, when you know, a third or at least of the population of Europe died and there were no priests to perform the last rite. So these were, it was a guy. So anyway, so yeah, we decided, so we decided to do it. And um, it was a wild shot in the dark, really. We just went for the best people we could find. You know, it was just the beginning of this, uh, a more holistic approach to death and dying. And of course, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross years earlier had done her work and, you know, that's pretty well known. But there hadn't been, there were a few people around like Stephen Levine, who dies, it was a, a friend of Ram Dass, um, but there wasn't a lot going on. So we basically were able to gather a real spectrum of people. God, I think it was even before the death duelers started happening. Um, I remember we started off with a dialogue between Bob and a guy called Sherwin Newland, who, who wrote a book called How We Die, and it was number one in the New York Times bestsellers the very week that the brochures landed, because this was brochures, this was before the internet, before the brochures landed in people's mailboxes. So, you know, we wanted to take, of course, there's the Tibet, so we always say, it, it, there's, it has a practical dimension, you know, from actually being with the dying, the Zen tradition, a lot of the people like Frank Ostaseski, um, and, you know, the San Francisco Zen Center, they started doing this work during the nadir of the AIDS epidemic, when nobody wanted to work with dying AIDS patients. The Zen Center was willing to do it. They wound up starting uh, the Zen Hospice. And so they were real pioneers of just, you know, being present, compassionate presence at the bedside. There was that kind of thing. But, you know, the Zen tradition doesn't pay a, a lot of attention to what goes on after death. But the Tibetans do. <laughs> and uh, so, of course, we wanted to look at what the Tibetan view is of uh, the after death. And I'm personally, as you know from my book, I'm a big fan of Rudolf Steiner, who um, is one of the most brilliant spiritual figures of the 20th century, in my money. And he, uh, you know, he felt that returning to the world, the contemporary world, a correct and scrupulous understanding of karma and reincarnation was just about his most important work. And the dude did an amazing 6,000 lectures. And whoa, he was an incredible powerhouse of enormous wisdom. But I've always, you know, ever since I read his material on the journey of the soul between death and rebirth, it's extremely lucid. I mean, I've had the privilege of listening to Tibetan lamas and people like Bob Thurman explicate uh, the Bardo states and all of that. And I can't say I, I fully understand it. I get some of it, but not all of it. Whereas uh, Rudolf Steiner's material on the death, the journey of the soul between death and rebirth is impeccable and crystal clear. I've read some of those lectures 10 times and get something different from it every time. And that's a real proof of spiritual authenticity when you can read something 10 times and see something each time that you hadn't noticed before. So we had that, you know, we had that more esoteric dimension of after death. We had being fully present, you know, we dealt with practical stuff like, you know, the ethics around dying and um, what else? 
we looked at a multi multicultural views of death. I think we had a Native American perspective on it as well. Um, and we didn't really know who was going to come. I'd have to look back on the brochure to see exactly who was there, but in terms of presenters, but it was really the first major event in its field. And it blew our minds. It sold out, bam, like that. We, we did it in a big hotel in Midtown Manhattan on Broadway and 49th Street. And uh, it sold out, 700 people, bam, just like that. And we didn't know, and I, um, yeah, I'd never spoken to 700 people before. I, remember, I can still remember psyching myself to say, okay, here we go. You know, walk up to the front, you know, and that, I mean, I'm not a medical professional. I don't know. Uh, who am I to be up there talking about death? Uh, so, uh, and it turned out that, you know, 85% of the attendees were professionals, actually. You know, we didn't really know who would come, um, but they were, you know, hospice nurses, doctors, social workers. A lot of people, psychologists, people who work in the arts with the dying, um, et cetera. So it was a brilliantly successful experience. And then, then we did two, we did two more. I think it was 98 and then in 2000, each one with eight, 900 people. Actually, the last one we did was in the World Trade Center, funnily enough, where we did that big conference on dying and the site that became the greatest center for dying in America. So, um, you know, for me personally, when some say when my father died, uh, which is quite a while ago now, but he, um, it's very useful to have engaged with death because most people are in denial around it. And the reason we wanted to do it, or one of the reasons we wanted to do it is because obviously we, most Western culture, we're, we're in denial about it. You know, but you don't deal with death until, you know, you either get a diagnosis, a fatal diagnosis, or you're in some life-threatening emergency, other than blah, 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 forget about it. I think I... Whereas, of course, I take the view, and I think it's the wiser view, the Zen view, and you know, when the sun goes down tonight, your life and mine, it's all a day shorter, isn't it? So what are we gonna do with this precious gift of life? So by being conscious of death, rather than ignoring it, it actually enables us to live each day more intensely and more fully and to really commit every moment of every day to some sense of uh, wholeness and value and meaning. So yes, so it was, it was this process of bringing death out from the corners, not being more of it about it. You know, you can get people, you can get a sort of superstitious, you know, if I focus on death and do it, that means that I'm gonna die, you know, it's, mm. you can have that sort of misplaced magical thinking. Um, so I would just say it's been a very, very fulfilling experience. You know, I mean, right now there's an art of dying training going on right now. And, uh, you know, I just see what it, uh, what it does for people. And of course, these are, these are people who want to become professionals in the field. You know, they want to become death doulas who are, you know, doulas are usually uh, figures for birth to help the midwife. But of course, this whole phenomenon of death doulas to help the final vigil because even when even if people are in a hospice often those last few hours four or five hours of active dying they can be alone so death doulas are trained to be there for that final vigil and to work with uh, work with the family and so on around how to prepare for death and how to deal with the body afterwards and you know the, it, it's more spiritually and psychologically sophisticated um so yes, it's been a very, you know, I never imagined when we started it back in 95 that it would still be going on 26 years later. But it's the same as it, I started these two major events in 95. One was the art of dying, spiritual, scientific and practical approaches to living and dying, I think is what we call the subtitle. And the other was the esoteric quest uh, which we didn't even, well, we came up with the name Esoteric Quest because we needed a, an internet handle, but um, the first conference on the Western esoteric tradition, you know, which we called the Rosicrucian Enlightenment Revisited because it was done in the, uh, the little town, the Southern Bohemian Mecca of Alchemist, Chesky Krumlov, which I had stumbled across with a German friend of mine, um, right in the aftermath of communism. And it just as well, I had somebody with me who could speak German because nobody, could speak a word of English down there in those days, um, just Czech and Russian and German. 
And, uh, and of course, I didn't imagine when we did that Rosicrucian Enlightenment Revisited, which Gnosis Magazine described as an esoteric Woodstock, because anybody was, I couldn't believe it. everybody I invited to this obscure little place, and everybody, all the speakers agreed to come. So anyway, both of those things started, one in the spring, the other in the autumn of 95. And here we are 26 years later, they're both going on. Um, so they're meaningful, you know, on the one hand, the quest is, is mining that golden thread of holy wisdom in the West, which, you know, of course, I'm a fan of the Eastern and shamanic paths as well, but it's, it's a bit crazy that here we are, most of us from a European heritage and we're ignoring, or many people are, the, the, the wisdom traditions from the Western tradition. But of course, you know, you've got to engage in a kind of spiritual archeology span there, you've got to dig it out because it's been suppressed by the Inquisition or through war or neglect. So yes, it's, it's been a very fulfilling experience to do both of those, actually. I've had really outstanding memories. And it's just, you know, it's the whole thing you get when you, you serve consciousness, for want of a better phrase. You try to do something that's going to enhance consciousness, either bringing alive again our forgotten holy wisdom um, or engaging with something as inescapable and vital for every one of us as death and dying. Remarkable. We talked uh, quite a bit actually about the esoteric quests. Yeah, you did several of those in, in in all sorts of locations around the world. We talked about that in some detail in the first episode. Although I do have a, a follow up question about that actually from uh, fr from that episode. But about the um, art of dying, I'm curious in what ways your engaging with death was useful when it came to your father's death. Yeah, well, you know it. It's not that I have, um, I mean, I don't spend a lot of time, you know, I'm not working with it on a daily basis professionally. It's more when I, when we're creating programs and events around it, but it, you know, it's, it's not something I've brushed away or just been in the recesses of my mind that I prefer to not even think about it. I've thought about it a lot. And um, from perspective of actually practitioners working with the dying to the whole esoteric view of the journey of the soul after death, whether it's the Tibetan view or whether it's Rudolf Steiner's research. Um, so it just, it means you, you're in less of a state of uh, shock, maybe. You've got a bit of psychological preparation for it. You give, for me, having a more esoteric view of death, it seems to me the evidence of <laughs> my sense is overwhelming. You know, I've been into this stuff for 35 years and my sense of the esoteric nature of death <laughs> goes only stronger with each passing year. So you're able to handle it with a greater measure of equanimity, I think, than uh, that I might have been able to otherwise. Um, and actually, my father actually, uh, you know, he he did not believe in survival of consciousness after death. He was in the thick of the Second World War, saw a lot of death, and. Um, yeah, well, was not a religiously oriented person. Um, but when he, he, we found, he made a conscious decision to die, we found out from the nurses, because the following day was going to be my mother's birthday, and he didn't want to die on my mother's birthday. And I had to get back from America. So he asked us to remove the oxygen tubes from his uh, nose. And, um, and then he was literally, I mean, he was just, minutes away from death and he I don't know where he had the strength from but his arms his arms were by his side and his arms rose up from his side and he made this most beautiful gesture of receptivity like that it was the most spiritual gesture I ever saw my father make in his life he made this beautiful it was like a grail uh, receptacle as it were and then you know then his arms came down like that and then he, he opened his eyes and he had these huge, wide staring saucer. I have never seen such sort of mega. He was looking over the top of my head. He was clearly seeing something. And I, you know, I couldn't, it looked like he was sort of stunned uh, because he definitely thought that there was no consciousness after death. Um, and so he, my own father, you know, actually it's the only death I've ever been present at actually. Um, but he gave me a kind of teaching that it wasn't just, you know, I'm history. <laughs> it was, I mean, something happened there. 
something profound and it certainly looked like he was seeing something that he hadn't expected to see and what that massive gesture of spiritual reset well that's how i interpreted it was it, it just looked like he was preparing for a passage in some way um so yeah so you know when a parent dies um, i mean my mother has since died years later but uh, you're you're orphaned you know you're left in the world it's the finality of it all the fact that even though i'd lived in america for decades and had lived at home since i was you know 17 really so um but yes it's the finality the fact that you'll never hear that voice again you'll never hear them shut the garage door that way again that boom it's over and uh it depends you know i found my mother's death easier because my I think we pretty much completed what, you know, we had a good communication. I had a more difficult relationship with my father. So there was, there was, um, there was a lot that was unexpressed that had never been expressed. He was not, you know, he was the sort of stiff upper lip kind of Brit, you know, he certainly wasn't into sharing his feelings about, about anything. So he, um, yeah, I think it was, it was, Different, more difficult for me to handle because there was so little that had been expressed and also I'd hoped to have a final conversation with him and you know I'd come back I'd gone through a terrible snowstorm it was this is in Huddersfield you know there's like nine inches of snow there's more snow that in decades the biggest November snowstorm uh, it was it was a crazy trying to get there the flight was extremely nerve-wracking the pilot announced that's the word fly, flying from british airways for 30 years that's the worst flight that's what he says the moment we landed it's, whoa it, that really was as wild as it seemed to be and um so yes it led for my father there was there was a significant uh, emotional residue because there was so much unsaid when he died but it's just a reminder to you know if you've got something to say to one of your parents or friends or whoever it may be, say it. Say it while you still can. And uh, speak from the heart. And uh, don't, if there's some love in there that's unexpressed, get it out there. Take a risk if you can. Uh, because otherwise, you know, you will be left with a feeling of things unfinished. But of course, if you have a reincarnational view of the future, <laughs> then uh, these things can take place another time in another place and another level of reality <laughs> how did you handle that emotional residue well uh i remember waking up in the middle of the night and writing the eulogy so rather than just tossing and turning in bed you know you go into an altered state after a death like that at least i did anyway where you can't you know your normal sleeping patterns are interrupted so I wrote the eulogy, you know, I, th I think having things like a funeral, going through that uh, grieving process, you know, having a wake. Um, <laughs> my mother's Irish, so I can say this, you know, what's the difference between an Irish wedding and an Irish wake? There's, a, there's one less drunk at the last. <laughs> so there's, but we, you know, we did a wonderful wake actually back at to my parents' house and uh, everybody got, you know, a bit sloshed there, and then, you know, that's what you want to do. These are the, the things that have a bit of festivity, have a laugh, have some warmth, bring people together. The virtue of, um, the, you know, one of the good things you might say about death is it brings people together, it brings the family together. So relatives of mine in Belfast that I hadn't seen in years came and uh, other family came up from Cardiff and so on. So there's a sense of psychological bonding and strengthening and deepening, which is heartwarming. And it, but I think going through those rituals, like a funeral awake, you know, and even though we didn't formally call it awake, you know, it's just that gathering of friends um, and relatives. And, I th and then you just, I don't remember any, you know, it's just a gradual process of, um, I think, you know, it certainly brings up for you what you honored and respected and appreciated about your relationship with that person. You know, I mean, the good things uh, in my relationship with my father, we, we did have a pretty good relationship until I became a teenager. And uh, then, and then, you know, 
it was like short back and sides and those long air turbots and you know, all that rock and roll. You know? <laughs> it's people forget just how bitter in the sixties the the war between the generations was, you know, and that old generation of Brits who'd fought the Second World War. You know, <laughs> my they were certainly, and my father was not conservative politically. He was a lifetime, lifelong Labour Party supporter and man of the left, definitely. But then when it came to cultural stuff like rock music and long hands, <laughs> absolutely not. So, um, yeah, so there was a lot of tension between him. So it, it brings up the good things, the things that you treasure and, uh, and you know, your certain regrets, things that you might have said that you didn't. But I did, you know, after my father was diagnosed, I did go back to, to uh, Huddersfield, I actually spent a summer in Huddersfield in the summer of 96, for the first time since I'd left home in 67. And um, because I knew it was gonna be, I knew he'd been given a, a year, you know, to live as a diagnosis. So I thought, well, I'll just spend some time with him, you know. But that three months that I spent in Huddersfield, he never mentioned dying once. Okay, most people don't, you know, especially if they don't have a spiritual view of it. He, so we never got to process it at all, really. And uh, I would have been available to talk about it candidly. But um, I mean, that's one of the virtues of doing this dying work. You become more comfortable speaking about it rather than just, oh, I feel really uncomfortable. Let's move on to another subject. So there I was. But, you know, at least I did have those three months hanging out with him, even though we barely exchanged or well, we didn't exchange a single word about the whole topic. Um, but you just that's all you can do. You can just be with people. And I'm glad I did it. Yeah. So, you know, that's the virtue of doing this holistic work, isn't it? That we're dealing with profound matters. It's not just, you know, how to get a certain grade in university or in school to, you know, so you can get a good job or something. I mean, not that that's irrelevant, but um, it's the virtue of having done all this work all these years. You have engaged with the deepest issues of life. Um, of meaning, of life and death, of, of consciousness, of, you know, what we're all doing here. And, uh, you know, I'm just somebody who from a very early age, from a, being a child, really, eight, nine years old, I just wanted to know, you know, what, what are we doing here? I mean, what is this? <laughs> you know, and it never seems to, enough of an answer to just, you know, you go to school, you know, you get a job, you work, you die. <laughs> That's, no, it's got to be something more to it than that, hasn't that? Uh, so, and of course there is, and uh, it's just not taught in the establishment. Um, and of course, Britain, England especially, tends to be a real home of uh, hardcore materialistic thinking. I just remember when I was at university, <laughs> being given A.J. Ayer's language, truth and logic, the apex of logical positivism. I remember standing in line with some guy who was in the same class reading it. And he said he'd read two pages, slammed it shut and threw it against the wall. And to this day, I think that's the most sensible response. But you know, when I was at a university, the logical positivism was presented as the last word, you know, and the Oxford Wicker professor of logic was, it was this petty linguistic pedantry that, that asserted that even a question like, what is the meaning of life? That if you analyzed it with sufficient semantic rigor, you could find it was a meaningless question that could, uh, was a question that could not be posed. I mean, this is, I mean, it's the, that kind of stuff was being offered. Uh, like I said in my book, you know, I finally arrived at the Hall of the Philosophers when I was 18 and nobody was at home. I mean, you know, I, I, had to, I had to go to America, you know, and have all kinds of consciousness expanding experiences down Route 66 in the Southwestern deserts, you know, the, the West Coast counterculture, et cetera, um, to explore those deeper questions and then to find out, yes, there's all kinds of cultures and wisdom traditions and esoteric streams that ad address this. It's just not taught in the academic establishment. I mean, I'm sure it is more today. I mean, you've got, uh, I know in British universities, I mean, I, I know a lot of people who teach in American universities who have these kinds of sympathies and interests and they bring it into their work. But of course that was a long time ago. That was, I'm sorry to say, but that was half a century ago. <laughs> yeah, I ain't getting any younger. Mm. 
Fascinating. Ralph, this has been absolutely uh, amazing. Uh, I must say, um, gosh, you know, I think we could go on and on <laughs> about these things. You know, I'm very interested, and now I'm going to look it up, actually, a bit more detail, Steiner's. Yeah. That's the essence of Steiner on death. Uh, I'm curious about that. Yes, in fact, I just, uh, I just, got, I wrote an, a, an essay on Steiner called Rudolf Steiner, neglected spiritual genius, um, and then I, it, I just found out it, it's been translated into Chinese, <laughs> and they said, "Do you want me to send you any uh, box of books in Chinese?" Well, I said, "No, I can't read Chinese." So they, I just, what is it? I just got a huge big cardboard box filled with Chinese tea. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't, I don't drink tea, <laughs> but it's I got. I thought, well, well, you know. Well, the tea in China. So how nice <laughs> to be paid in China for writing about and, and tea uh, to be writing about Rudolf Steiner. But yes, I really do recommend it. It's it's profound and um, extremely worthwhile and, and very, because some people have a harder time than others reading Steiner. Just reading Steiner is a kind of meditative experience because just the sentences alone will bring, a, there's no writer or no philosopher I'm aware of who gives you completely new thoughts. So it's literally mind expanding to read Steiner. But yes, I, I find it um, yeah, just the most plausible, coherent and um, meaningful description of what happens after death. And of course, it, with Steiner being this comprehensive mind, the biggest mind I've ever come across in modern times, um, it, it's then placed into a huge, huge context. So yes, I, I certainly recommend to our, our listeners or our viewers that um, if they're interested, look at Steiner's book, the, you know, the various compilations, Life Beyond Death, The Journey of the Life Between Death and Rebirth. Uh, there's a whole uh, internet, RS archive, standing for Rudolf Steiner, rsarchive.org, where you can just go to that and you can just, you can just put in death and dying and see what came up. But of course, if you, you know, Steiner's not the kind of person you can just pick up and read because he makes a lot of references to etheric bodies and astral bodies and uh, higher beings and so on. So it's a whole highly, it's a deep worldview to say deep is an understatement. But yes, I, I, I recommend that very highly. Well, perhaps to end today then for my last question, a great passion as you've discussed in your life has been the Western esotericism as a path of, um, uh, you know, of, I suppose, great spiritual heritage. Where would you orient somebody? How would you orient somebody who's interested in finding out more about that and, and pursuing it uh, in a sort of ser serious way? So say somebody who's, much as you've done, investigated all sorts of traditions yeah. and cultures. Uh, you know, you've done these um, esoteric quest uh, conferences and deeply uh, steeped in Steiner and others. How would you orient somebody to begin well, such a, an exploration. Yeah. yeah, well, one book I would point people towards is, uh, is it called The Western Esoteric Tradition or is The History of the Western Esoteric Tradition by Nicholas Goodrick Clark, uh, G-O-O-D-R-I-C-K hyphen C-L-A-R-K-E, is there any on the end? But anyway, Nicholas Goodrick Clark, um, The Western Esoteric Tradition, um, he actually thanked, he, he wrote a very nice appreciation of me in the, uh, because it was inspired by the esoteric quest, Nicholas's intent, because he came to all the esoteric quests, was to bring that work and bring it into academia, which he did. He, he founded a whole center for the study of Western esotericism at the University of Exeter that was doing beautifully. It had more students coming from all over the world. It had the highest rate of students going from masters to PhD of any, uh, anywhere and any course in the uh, the university but then tragically nicholas died he had a very virulent form of cancer and it was just six weeks from diagnosis to death and it's tragic because he was just a wonderful person nobody could spit out a date like nicholas um, but anyway nicholas goodrick clark's book on the western esoteric tradition uh, i'd highly recommend that is uh, the most comprehensive uh, overview um, of the whole thing. I think that's really the place to start. I mean, there, there's another book called, uh, by a good friend of mine called Christopher Bamford, um, who's another expatriate Brit living in America called An Endless Trace. 
about uh, there's another book by uh, which is actually you know the open sun had a magazine called lapis for a number of years and we published a series a 14 part series by jocelyn godwin who's another expatriate brit <laughs> these are all brits who was living in america um anyway jocelyn godwin uh, is it called the uh, the golden chain i think it is or is it the golden uh, i think it's called the golden chain so the golden chain by nick by christopher bamford an endless uh, sorry an endless trace by christopher bamford the golden chain by jocelyn godwin and the history of the western esoteric tradition by nicholas goodrick clark i would say those are three good solid ways to get and of course they're all friends of mine so i'm prejudiced but they've all well, of course, Nicholas is no longer with us, but they've all spoken at, uh, at multiple quests. So they're, they're part of that stream. Yeah, so I'd say if you could look, look at any of those three, and they're all really gifted writers as well. So that'd be a place to begin. Um, you know, when we started doing those quests, it was more just individual little organizations, like some organization that thought it was Rosicrucian and so on. When we brought that together in 95, it was really one of the first of not having anything cultish associated with it. Um, taking it seriously, but approaching it with rigor, but also with humor and with conviviality. Um, yeah, Chesky Krumlov. <laughs> Bohemia, the world capital of beer, where all the, all the bars in Chesky Krumlov, you know, they were like little alchemical laboratories that you go down to. It was like really stepping into another reality. I mean, you know, with all the events that I've produced in my life, that first one, the Rosicrucian Enlightenment Revisited on the Western Mystery Tradition in Bohemia. And that was one of those, it was like that week in Lombok. It, except it wasn't just about me having fun. It was doing it with about a hundred or so other people. Yes, and I was just thinking back of Robert Bly, who was at that first esoteric conference, and uh, people think of him as a poet, which of course he was, and a translator of Rumi and Hafez and the great Sufi poets. And um, but he was actually a deeply spiritual and esoteric person himself. And I'll never forget in the alchemical castle of Chesky Krumlov in the Renaissance room, him doing an evening of Rosicrucian and Sufi poetry. It was, you know, one of those peak moments where, you, you know, you take a gamble, you know, I mean, I, I, this obscure town that had been behind the Iron Curtain for 60 years that nobody had ever heard of, and that all the presenters agreed to come, and then a um, hundred people showed up and you know this is before we did minimal marketing and I think people came from 20 different countries and I have no idea how they found out about it it was just one it was an uncanny experience but yes it launched a, a 25 or a quarter century long series and still counting so yeah sometimes things took work out very well but it's like the first art of dying total gamble total shot in the dark we might fall on our face um but both it and the quest work beautifully mm. here we are years later still at it well these two conversations have been uh, just so remarkable ralph thank you very much i think perhaps oh, uh, yeah perhaps one day i'll uh, uh recruit you for another another episode you know there's there's some actually one of the themes that i was very interested to talk to you about that i think perhaps not not today is you know you've met many remarkable people you're talking about robert bly there i think there's some um, probably stories about robert bly and perspectives on robert bly for example that you have that are not widely known and uh, I'd, I'd like to quiz you about that you've, you've also in your in your time of course in the open center met, met many people um but in your previous uh, searching also Oscar Ishado, for example, uh, is it? Yeah. Oscar Ichasso, I see. Yeah. Ichasso, yeah. Amazing. And uh, D uh, Dane Rudyar. Dane Rudyar, right. For example, you know, these are some people that. Uh, oh, that... <laughs> yes, I mean, that's, yes, I've had the good fortune to meet, you know, the vast majority of the major figures in the whole consciousness world or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. And most of them have been wonderful, I have to say. And uh, yeah, there are some, most people I'll say are not fully aware of that deep spiritual esoteric side of Robert Bly. They might think more of Ian John or whatever it might be, uh, or him as just as a poet. But mm. yeah, he was a deep, deep person and a 
very penetrating cultural critic and a very politically engaged, outspoken, brave, courageous individual. And, you know, Robert Bly had a, a very crotchety, curmudgeonly personality. But it was really just because he was an incredibly sensitive person. <laughs> he just had, in my view, he just had to maintain that sort of curmudgeonly exterior maybe as a form of uh, self-protection, but he was just an outstanding human being. And, you know, he just died. What was that? I wrote a little piece actually for the Open Center website on an appreciation of Robert Bly, um, but he was a really wonderful man and a, a man with real soul. You know, he understood along with James Hillman, the psychologist and others, but you can't, you don't want to go straight up to being spiritual. You go down, you go down into the realm of soul making and before you go up into the realm of spirituality, if you're going to be a balanced person. So, um, yeah, I miss Robert Bly, even though he had not been doing public appearances in probably the last decade because of his own health situation. But he was, you know, one of those really outstanding, deep, brilliant, soulful human beings. His knowledge of literature and poetry was just phenomenal. Um, so I miss him, yeah. When I look back on the Open Center, I, I think Robert Bly was one of the, you know, one of the seminal core people who was with us through that long journey. Yeah, bon voyage into the higher realms. And of course he did more than just about anybody and maybe only Coleman Barks to bring Rumi and Hafez, you know, the great Russian Sufi poets, to, uh, to bring them into the modern world. So he made a great contribution. Yeah. So happy to do that, Steve, at some future point. Yes, I, I met a lot of them. And uh, yeah, it's been a gift. Perhaps we'll do a rogues gallery episode then. A rogues gallery, yeah, the real story. <laughs> of, uh, <laughs> these people behind the uh, spiritual veneer, what were they really like? Yeah, but that's the most of them are lovely people. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ralph White, thank you once again. Steve James, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And I wish you all the best with your podcast in the future. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.